Today's video features three terrifying home invasions that have never been officially solved. Before that, I want to recommend a fascinating documentary series I saw on Magellan TV, who is today's sponsor. The documentary is called Chain Gang Girls, and it's the remarkable story about 15 women who do hard labor on a chain gang in Arizona. This is just one of the over 2,000 documentaries that are available on Magellan TV. Magellan TV was started by filmmakers, and they have an eclectic mix of documentaries in genres like biography, space, and my favorite, crime and mystery. The documentaries are ad-free, and many of them are available in stunning 4K. Magellan TV is also easy to access. You can watch it on Google Play, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, and iOS, or simply cast from your phone to your TV. You should check out Magellan TV for yourself by going to MagellanTV.com slash criminally listed and you'll get a month for free. When you get Magellan TV, you'll get access to thousands of great documentaries and you'll also be supporting criminally listed. Number 3. Sarah Powell At around 9.30 on the morning of November 16th, 1993, a strange phone call came into a post office in Clear Lake, which is a city in the greater Houston area. The caller was a girl who sounded like she was in her early teens. The girl said she didn't know who she was or where she was. She said she was tied up and she was in a pink room that had teddy bears in it. The girl said she managed to get the phone off the hook with her mouth she hit redial with her tongue, and it called the post office. One of the post office employees, Debbie Powell, was sure that the caller was her 14-year-old daughter, Sarah Powell. Sarah had stayed home from school that day because she was sick. Debbie asked a co-worker to call the police, and then she raced home. When Debbie got to her home, police officers were waiting for her. She opened the front door and entered the house with some police officers. The house had been completely ransacked. Debbie raced upstairs to Sarah's room. Sarah was laying hogtied on the floor of her bedroom. When Debbie moved close to her daughter, her daughter started screaming. Sarah claimed she did not know who her mother was. She also pleaded with her mother not to hurt her. An officer had to lead Debbie away from Sarah because Sarah was so upset. An officer got Sarah out of her bindings and he asked her what happened. Sarah said she did not remember being tied up. In fact, she said she couldn't even remember who she was. Sarah was shown photographs of her family and her friends, and she said she didn't recognize them, and she did not recognize her own home. The police thought that the crime scene looked odd. They did not find any signs of a break-in or forced entry. Also, while the house had been thoroughly ransacked, nothing had been stolen. What the police found most troubling was that it was a rainy day, but they did not find any shoe or boot prints inside the house. The police thought that Sarah might have been involved in the ransacking of her home. They also were not convinced that she had lost all her memories. However, they could not explain why she would have wanted to trash her own home. Days after the incident, Sarah's memory still had not returned. Debbie initially thought that Sarah had been threatened to keep quiet, so that was why she was telling the police she didn't remember anything. Debbie assumed that after the police left, Sarah would drop the act and tell her what happened. But that did not happen. Debbie even tried to trick Sarah to see if it was an act, but it didn't work. Sarah had supposedly forgotten how to do basic things like brush her teeth, write her name, and tie her shoes. 
She apparently had to relearn these skills. Her family tried to stir her memories with photographs, but Sarah continued to claim that she didn't recognize anyone who was in her life. Debbie said her daughter was a shell of her former self. She said it was as if someone had kidnapped her daughter. Sarah's body was there, but her mind was not. After two months, Sarah had relearned the basic skills she had supposedly forgotten. One day, Sarah and Debbie were walking on the grounds of the school that Sarah attended. Suddenly, Sarah fell to the ground and started convulsing. Debbie was sure it was a seizure. When Sarah stopped convulsing, she said, I didn't let them in. Sarah claimed because of the seizure, some of her memories from that morning had come back to her. Sarah said that at around 8.30 a.m., she put the dog in the laundry room. Then she heard a loud noise come from the second floor. She ran to the second floor and saw two men trying to force open her bedroom window. She called her mother's work, but the line was busy, so she hung up. Sarah rushed downstairs, and she was planning on going out through the front door. The door had a double padlock, and keys were needed to open it. Sarah couldn't find her keys, so she couldn't get out the front door. Then the sounds from upstairs stopped. Slowly, Sarah crept back upstairs, and she didn't see the men at her window. Then suddenly, she was grabbed from behind and forced onto the bed. One of the men put a pillow over her head. Sarah struggled at first, but then stopped moving when she couldn't breathe. Then the man removed the pillow from her head. After he did, Sarah sat up and looked at the two men. One was wearing a mask, and the other one was wearing a stocking over his head. The man who was wearing the mask was smaller than the man who was wearing the stocking. The man wearing the stocking was armed with a gun. Sarah said that the man hit her in the head with the butt of the pistol. She then blacked out. Sarah said that was all she remembered. Then, a short time later, Sarah had another seizure and she said that more memories came back to her. She said that she was alone in the bedroom with the smaller man who was wearing the mask. He told her to stay calm and if she did what she was told to do, she wouldn't get hurt. Then the larger man came back into the room and he was angry that they were talking. Sarah said that the man aimed the gun at her head and then he pulled the trigger. But, for whatever reason, the gun didn't fire. The larger man then ordered the smaller man to tie up Sarah and he did. While Sarah was being tied up, the larger man trashed the house. Sarah said that two women were with them. She said she could hear the women talking downstairs. Then the larger man and the two women came upstairs and joined the smaller man in Sarah's bedroom. They all exited through Sarah's bedroom window. After they left, Sarah fainted. When she came to, she couldn't remember anything about her past, not even her own name. Using her mouth, she got the phone off the hook. But she did not know what number to call because she couldn't remember anything. So she hit redial. The last number she had called was the post office where her mother worked. She had called when the men were supposedly trying to break in, but she got a busy signal. The police were not convinced by Sarah's story of a home invasion. 
They asked Sarah if she would be hypnotized, and she agreed. Under hypnosis, Sarah told the same story about the home invasion, but the police were still unconvinced. They thought there were simply too many problems with the apparent crime scene. There was no evidence that anyone, let alone four people, broke in. The police found no strange fingerprints and there were no boot or shoe prints even though it was raining that day. Also, why would four people break into a suburban home on a weekday morning, ransack it, but steal nothing? People who believe Sarah Counter, why would she ransack her own home and then fake amnesia for several months? The chief of psychology at Texas Children's Hospital said that Sarah could have suffered a unique type of amnesia. During the home invasion, she was suffocated and she was struck in the head. Also, the home invasion would have been a traumatic experience. Together, these elements could have caused the amnesia. In total, Sarah had nine seizures and she supposedly regained all her memories. Although the police weren't convinced that there really was a home invasion, they had Sarah sit down with a sketch artist. She described what the large muscular man may have looked like without the stocking on his head. She said he was about 5'10 and he was in his 30s or 40s. She also noticed that on his right arm, he had a tattoo in blue ink of a cobra. The man and his associates, if they exist, have never been identified. Sarah Powell grew up and got married. In 2002, she was going by the name Sarah Estes and she had two children. Sarah said that she suffers from depression because she's worried she'll lose her memory again at any time. Number 2. Irma Palasics Irma and Gregor Plastics grew up across the road from each other in a small town in Hungary. They were wed in 1947. A year later, Irma gave birth to a daughter. Eight years later, she gave birth to a second daughter. In 1956, the same year that their second daughter was born, the Hungarian Revolution began. Irma convinced Gregor that they should leave all their possessions and flee the country. They got out of Hungary the day before the borders closed. The family eventually made their way to Australia. They struggled at first because they didn't speak English and they didn't know anyone in the country. They bought a piece of land and with their own hands they built a house. They ended up selling that house and they purchased another plot of land. Once again, they built a house and then sold it. In 1962, they purchased some land in Red Hill, which is a suburb of Canberra, Australian Capital Territory. They built what they hoped would be their forever home. They raised their daughters in the home. Their two daughters went on to get married, and between them, they had five boys. Irma and Gregor loved being grandparents. In 1997, a person or persons broke into their home. Irma and Gregor didn't trust banks, so they kept a lot of cash in their home. The thief, or thieves, managed to steal $100,000 plus some jewelry. No arrests were made in the break-in. The next year, Irma came home and found two men wearing balaclavas in her garage. One of the men attacked her and she managed to pull off his balaclava. When she did, he let her go, but he swore he'd be back. 
Then he and his partner ran off into the darkness of the night. The ordeal terrified Irma. She and Gregor decided to sell their beloved home and they moved to McKellar, which is a different suburb of Canberra that was about 12 miles from their old home. They spent a lot of money on security, but sadly, it did not help them. At about 9.30 p.m. on November 6, 1999, as Gregor and Irma were watching television, two men wearing balaclavas broke into their home. They tied up the elderly couple and beat them severely. The home invaders demanded to know where the money was. Over two hours, they ransacked the house and tortured the grandparents. Then the two men left with some money and some jewelry. When they were gone, Gregor was able to free himself. He got to a phone and called for help. Sadly, it was too late for 72-year-old Irma. She died at the scene. Gregor, who was 73, was hospitalized and eventually recovered. The police investigated the murder and forensic experts found DNA from one of the home invaders. But the DNA did not lead to an arrest. Several years after Irma was killed, Gregor died. His family said that some of his final thoughts were that he failed as a husband and as a protector. In August 2012, nearly 13 years after the murder, the police announced that they thought that they had a major break in the case. They said that they were looking for five young men who broke into a mini golf course in 2010. They even released a video of the break-in. But the police did not explain how the break-in was connected to Irma's murder. They didn't explain the connection until two years later. It turned out that DNA had been found at the break-in at the golf course. DNA testing was done, and it was thought that the DNA found at the mini golf course belonged to the son of one of the men who had killed Irma. But then, 11 months later, the police ruled out the DNA connection because an error had been made. A detective said that familial DNA was a new technology and it was the first time it was used in Australian Capital Territory. While there was an error in that testing, another DNA test was done and it confirmed something that the police had always suspected. The DNA found at Irma's murder scene was compared to DNA found at the 1998 break-in. It was a match. The police suspected that the break-ins in 1997 and 1998 were connected to the deadly home invasion in 1999. Now they have proof that at least one man broke into the couple's home twice. There is currently a reward of half a million dollars for information that leads to an arrest in the case. Irma's family says that they are frustrated by the lack of progress on the case and they are sick of getting nothing but silence from the police. Irma's family thinks that the DNA will lead to an arrest. The family hopes that the case will be solved using forensic genealogy which was the process that was used to identify the Golden State Killer. If the police commission a forensic genealogical investigation, it may just be a matter of time before an arrest is made. Number 1. The Wonderland Murders On July 1, 1981, some movers were moving furniture into the house next door to 8763 Wonderland Avenue in the Laurel Canyon area of Los Angeles, California. The movers heard some moaning coming from the house, so they went to investigate. The interior of the house was splattered with blood. 
The moaning they heard was coming from 29-year-old Susan Lanias. She had been savagely beaten in the head. The movers called 911 and first responders arrived on the scene. Susan was taken to the hospital. The police looked around the rest of the house. The couple who were leasing the home, 44-year-old Billy Deverell and 46-year-old Joy Miller, were found in their bed. Both were deceased. Susan and her husband, 37-year-old Ron Lanius, were house guests. Ron was also found dead in the home. A fourth dead body was found in the home. She was 22-year-old Barbara Richardson. They had all been savagely beaten to death. It's believed that they were killed with iron pipes and at least one baseball bat. Several officers said that the murders were more gruesome than the murders committed by the followers of Charles Manson 12 years earlier. Susan Lanius would go on to survive her injuries, but she was left with brain damage and she had no memory of that night. Three of the five people who were attacked that night were members of a cocaine trafficking gang called the Wonderland Gang. They were Billy Deverell, Joy Miller, and Ron Lanius. Neither Susan Lanius nor Barbara Richardson were members of the gang. Susan was married to Ron and Barbara was dating a gang member named David Lynn who was not in the house that night. The fifth and final member of the gang was a man named Tracy McCourt. McCourt was at his own home on the night of the home invasion. At the crime scene, the police found what they thought was a solid piece of evidence. It was a bloody palm print. It was found on the railing of the bed where Ron had died. The police ran the print and they came up with a match. The palm print belonged to adult film star John C. Holmes. John had started dozens of hardcore adult movies. Often, his character's name was Johnny Wad. At the time of the murders, John had a severe cocaine addiction. Incidentally, John had been arrested 10 days after the mass murder. He had previously been convicted of grand theft, but he did not appear for his sentencing hearing. Even though he had jumped on, after he was arrested, he was released on his own accord. After that, he vanished. About five months later, the authorities learned that John Holmes was hiding out in Miami, Florida. On December 4th, 1981, John was arrested without incident. John was interviewed by a detective named Frank Tomlinson. John told Detective Tomlinson that the murders were ordered by a man named Eddie Nash. Nash was born at Del Nazarel in British Palestine in April 1929. He emigrated to the United States in the early 1950s. Supposedly, he only had $7 when he arrived in the United States. Nash worked hard and by the 1970s he was a very wealthy man. He owned several nightclubs and strip clubs in Los Angeles. John told Detective Tomlinson that the day before the murders, the Wonderland gang had performed a home invasion of their own. The victim of the home invasion was Eddie Nash. They stole some money, property, and a lot of cocaine. John said that Nash knew he was involved in the home invasion and he demanded to know who did it. John said he didn't want to tell him but Nash threatened him and his family. So John told him it was the Wonderland Gang. 
John said that Nash was furious and he ordered him to take three men to the gang's house. John claimed he was then forced to watch as they were all beat to death. Besides mentioning Eddie Nash, John refused to say who was involved in the murder. Nash and his bodyguard, Gregory Diles, both denied being involved in the Wonderland murders. Also, no physical evidence connected them to the murders. John Holmes was eventually charged with all four murders himself. He went to trial in June 1982, nearly a year after the murders. The main piece of evidence against him was the bloody palm print that was found on the railing of the bed. The other evidence was the testimony of Detective Frank Tomlinson, who said that John had confessed to taking the killers to the house and being there while the murders happened. Tomlinson even testified that the murders were ordered by Eddie Nash. The prosecution acknowledged that Nash was probably the mastermind, but they maintained that John Holmes was an integral person in the massacre. John's lawyer contended that John had nothing to do with the Wonderland murders and he knew nothing about them. John was addicted to cocaine, so he visited the house in Wonderland often. His lawyer said he could have left his palm print there at any time. The jury ended up acquitting John Holmes of all charges. After his trial, John told reporters that he was planning on getting back into acting. And he did just that, but most of the time it was just cameo roles. In November 1986, John Holmes was diagnosed as HIV positive. After the diagnosis, he made two more hardcore adult films. John did not reveal to his co-stars that he was HIV positive and he had unprotected sex with them. Luckily, none of his co-stars contracted HIV. Months later, when it became obvious that John was seriously ill, he told people he had colon cancer. On March 13, 1988, John Holmes died of complications from AIDS. He was 43 years old. Weeks after John died, his first wife, Sharon Holmes, whom he had been married to for 20 years, sat down for an interview with the Los Angeles Times. Sharon said that John would often disappear from her life, but he'd always come back to her. She said that three weeks after the Wonderland murders, John paid her a visit. He said that he used to buy drugs from the Wonderland gang. He would also take property that the gang had stolen to Eddie Nash's home and exchange it for drugs. Then, the Wonderland gang decided to rob Nash. John went over to Nash's home earlier that day and he left a sliding door unlocked. That evening, Ron Lanius, Billy Deverell, David Lynn, and Tracy McCord went to Nash's home. McCord was the driver, and the three other men entered Nash's home through the sliding door. Inside, they held Nash and his bodyguard, Gregory Diles, at gunpoint. At some point during the home invasion, Diles was shot, but he was not too seriously injured. The Wonderland gang got away with money, drugs, and some property. John said that the day after the home invasion, a person who knew Nash saw him walking around while he was wearing a piece of Nash's jewelry. When John got back to his car, two armed men were waiting for him. They got him to follow them to Nash's home. When John got there, Nash was going through his address book. John said that Nash was threatening to kill his family if he didn't tell him who robbed him. John told him it was the Wonderland gang. 
John said that Nash forced him to take three of his men to the gang's home. When they got there, John used the intercom and he was buzzed into the home. Nash's three henchmen followed him into the house. Once they were in the house, John said that one of Nash's men made him stand up against a wall and then the man held a gun to his head. The other two men then proceeded to bludgeon everyone in the home. John claimed he heard a lot of screaming. John swore he didn't hurt anyone himself. Sharon Holmes said that she believes, at the very least, John was in the home when the murders were committed. As for Eddie Nash, he was arrested in November 1981, five months after the Wonderland murders. He was arrested after the police performed a raid on his home that was unrelated to the murders. Nash's house was raided because 17 days earlier, one of his employees overdosed on drugs and the police were sure he had gotten the drugs from Nash. During the raid, the police found two pounds of cocaine with a reported street value of a million dollars. In October 1982, just over three months after John Holmes was acquitted of murder, Nash was found guilty of possession with intent to sell. A month later, he was sentenced to eight years in prison but he only served about two years. A judge ended up releasing him early, citing health reasons. Nash supposedly told people that he had bribed the judge to get released. Then in September 1988, Nash and his bodyguard, Gregory Diles, were arrested and charged with the Wonderland murders. Their arrest stemmed from the fact that a man named Scott Thorson approached the police with information about the murders, which happened seven years earlier. Thorson had been the romantic partner of famed entertainer Liberace from 1977 to 1982. Thorson approached the police after he had been convicted of a drug-related armed robbery and he was awaiting sentencing. Thorson said he used to be a friend of Eddie Nash's and he used to buy drugs from him. He said that he was at Nash's home on the day after he was robbed, which was hours before the Wonderland murders. Nash was furious and he was ranting that he would kill John Holmes and his family. Thorson also said that Nash wanted to teach the people who robbed him a lesson and he would bring them to their knees. Thorson said that later, Nash confessed to him that he had ordered the murders. Nash said that the murders got out of hand. Nash and Diles were tried separately. Nash went to trial first in May 1990. John Holmes had died a couple years earlier, so the only person who testified against Nash was Scott Thorson. There was no physical evidence. The trial ended in a mistrial because the jury was deadlocked. Eleven of the jurors had voted to convict and one juror had voted to acquit. A couple weeks later, Tiles went to trial. His trial also ended in a mistrial because of a deadlocked jury. Ten jurors had voted to acquit and two voted to convict. Both men went to trial again in early 1981. This time, they were tried together. At the trial, their lawyers argued that another drug dealer was responsible for the quadruple murder. They claimed that the drug dealer did it as revenge for a drug deal that went wrong. The jury ended up acquitting both Nash and Diles. Gregory Diles died six years later in January 1997 from liver failure. Nine years after the acquittal, in May 2000, 
the district attorney announced that they were charging Eddie Nash with several crimes. This included running a cocaine and heroin distribution syndicate, laundering money, tax fraud, and tampering with a jury and witnesses. When Nash went to trial for the murders the first time, there was one holdout on the jury who voted to acquit. The juror who voted to acquit was an 18-year-old woman. Because she refused to convict, it led to a deadlocked jury which resulted in a mistrial. The district attorney said that they had evidence that Nash had bribed the juror with $50,000. In September 2001, Nash, who was 72, pleaded guilty to one count of money laundering and one count of wire fraud. He also admitted to bribing the juror at his murder trial, but the statute of limitations had run out on that crime. Nash was sentenced to four and a half years in prison and he was fined a quarter of a million dollars. Eddie Nash died in August 2014 at the age of 85. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, please check out criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases, buy merch, and find out about an exclusive podcast. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash criminallylisted. But that is all for today. Thanks again for watching.